So, um, my talk title is actually The Art of Bondage. And as titillating as that sounds, I'm afraid I have to disappoint you. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, my talk is actually about writing Go bindings. And see, I was feeling a bit guilty over this clickbaity title. I feel like BuzzFeed for a bit. So I would like to share a program that I wrote a couple of days ago, which will sort of tie in <laughs> uh, to the topic of this talk. It's a bit of a ridiculous program, really. But first, a little bit about me. As she mentioned, my life dream is to build a fully sentient and sapient artificial intelligence. And I figured if I, when the day comes that I actually finally build such an AI, I would need to communicate with it. And communicating with artificial intelligences, I believe, is very much like communicating with aliens. So last week, when I was starting to uh, sketch out this talk, I had this very cute idea. Uh, but today I noticed that our audience is a bit young, so I'm just going to do a Peter Parker and ask uh, who here has seen this really old movie called Close Encounters with the Third Kind? Great, only a few hands. But, so uh, to fill you in, Close Encounters, in, in Close Encounters with the Third Kind, there was an awesome scene towards the end where humans make first contact with an alien. And because they don't know exactly um, how the aliens communicated, they had uh, lights, they had sound, all, all kinds of communication methods with the aliens. And the humans played five notes repeatedly, and the aliens finally responded by completing the sentence. So that is essentially what I built. I built an artificial intelligence, well, neural network made basically, that um, does that. Cool. Um, I can't seem to show you that. What happens? OK, I'm sorry about that. Cool. All right, let's run the program. And mm. is there any audio? Cool. Now let's run this program. This program will run. And it's training in the background now, conditioning the neural network. Yes. OK, neural network's ready. So it makes a sound through a simple program called SimpleSynth, which is uh, by a programmer called not, not Hat or something like that. Uh, let's full screen this. And to play music, we just have to play music. We, I don't actually have a MIDI keyboard with me, so I have a virtual MIDI keyboard. Let's play the five notes. OK, the machine's still learning. So it's learning better. And um, let's try to get it to complete the sentence, shall we? There you go. Uh, so um, that was the program. Let me just turn this off. So why? Um, what does this have all to do with um, this talk, really? I mentioned earlier that this uh, program is a little bit ridiculous, and, that's, and here's why. And in fact, I'll act actually explain it in emoji, given that uh, the people in this room are quite young. Um, I set up, you notice that I set up simple synth and MIDI keys, right? So MIDI keys basically sends a message to the program, and the program takes the MIDI input stream events and copies it three times, once, to, uh, to an output, which is the speakers, once to a neural network, uh, which does its thing, and once to the display, right? You note that the display lights up every time I play a note, and every time the, the, alien, the AI responds, it also lights up. So what does this have to do with my talk? Well, virtually every black arrow you see in there is a connection formed and made with Seago. So from the MIDI keys to the program and from the program to the output, uh, audio output, I use port MIDI. And from the program to the display, I, I rely on OpenGL and the GLFW library. And finally, the neural network itself um, runs and uses Gorgonia, which can run on CUDA. I say can because on the way here, I had originally written a completely different version, different architecture for the neural network. But on the way here on the plane, I realized that the new MacBooks don't actually have uh, NVIDIA graphics card on them. So you can't actually use CUDA on them. So I had to rewrite it into a slightly more traditional um, recurrent neural network kind of architecture. 
But for the rest of the talk, I will be still using CUDA as a motivating example. You don't actually have to know much about CUDA or, or neural networks for that matter. You just, the, the learnings still transfer. And so, we begin by asking a question, why? Why do we need to write a library that uses an external library? Why not write it in pure Go? Well, simple, really. Number one, existing libraries that are written in Fortran. There, there, there are Fortran and C libraries that exist, and they are quite difficult to port over. Um, some of them, like GoNum uh, Blast, has been ported over, and it's the heroic effort of, in fact, the GoNum team, Brendan, Dan, Chad, and Sebastian. Amazing and great work. But there are some libraries out there, due to its proprietary nature, are downright impossible to port over. Things like OpenGL, things like CUDA. Okay? So, uh, as I mentioned, I'll be using Gorgonia's um, CUDA libraries, which I wrote for deep learning. You don't have to understand deep learning to um, understand this talk. But first, I'd like to go through some definitions. When I mention a C API, I literally mean a function written in a C code, some C library somewhere. Okay? And to access the C API, you call make a C go call, which looks something like that. And then finally, when I mention, when I say Go API or binding, I mean one of these things, right? They're also called wrapper functions, and they can take many forms. Here I've listed them from, from in, in order from the least user-friendly to the most user-friendly. Cool? The first one is basically exactly the same as making a seagull call. So at this point, I would like to establish the goal. The goal is to write a library uh, to, to, to provide Go APIs to access these C libraries functions. So why? Why not just, you know, call C Go? Well, there are actually multiple reasons for that, and as Rob Pike says, C Go is not Go, right? When you are writing in C Go, you're thinking in C. You have to work in C, but when you write the code, you're actually writing Go, and that is actually quite a bit of um, mental overload, right? So a good, well-written library that does the bindings will not actually expose any C parts, okay? On the surface level, from, from Godoc's point of view, it's exactly the same as if the entire library was written purely in Go. Now, speaking of hiding ting things, um, when you write Go code, you generally don't think about um, memory allocation or freeing memory and stuff like that. But when you bind to foreign libraries, you have to manage the memory yourself, and that leads to an insane amount of bookkeeping activity, right? And along the same lines, an API library that exposes a Go interface rather than just a C interface is actually quite more user-friendly. Um, oftentimes, these um, libraries like CUDA, they're quite low level, and there are multiple ways to do things, the same thing, which may confuse users. So an additional bonus worthy goal that we should be chasing after is a library that allows um, users to exposes this in such an idiomatic way and allows users to control them. Finally, having an API library will also allow you to have some kind of performance improvements over some common use cases. I'll actually touch on this with concrete examples later. Right, so why write an API? Well, in short, it is to provide a good user experience. Now, as far as I know, I'm the only person who's been using these CUDA APIs. But even so, my cognitive burden, I can feel myself not bothering so much about the memory allocation because I know my library is handling thread state memory allocation for me. Cool? So the rest of this talk will be partly about uh, strategies used to write these bindings and partly about designing an API in such a way that it's easy and understandable to use. We'll start first by looking at the manual process. Starting with the manual process is a good idea. It's a very slow process, but it also makes the project much clearer. You're actually forced to think about the actual use cases of these APIs simply because you are short of time. So what does the process look like? Well, the process is quite simple. You first take a seagull call, and you transform from A to B. You wrap it in a function into, and create one of these. Okay, we'll take the simplest um, case just for fun. And this is the wrapper function. You essentially just call the C go call. But this is horrible. This is terrible. Why? Uh, that's my Singapore reference. 
Uh, now, recall the purpose of us writing the API, li API library. It is to lighten the cognitive overhead of the user. If you write this, if you write this code, you might as well not write the function. And that was actually the case for, for the uh, CUDA library, uh, CUDNN library. I've been using it directly using Seago calls without actually writing a library. But it was so fiddly that about three years ago, I've, uh, I decided to actually sit down and write a proper library for it. So this is a bad design. So let's look at an alternative design that is slightly better. Here, you'll see that I created a, can you, oh, cool. Uh, you see that I created um, a handle, and internally it holds the internal type. Now, if you look at Godong, and you, you won't actually see the hidden uh, unexported fields. So you, the user wouldn't actually know that this is a CGO type. It doesn't have to be a struct. Uh, for context-free data structures, you can do something like that. And what do I mean by context-free? Well, I'll explain that later. But for now, know that uh, the important reason to actually ex return Go type is actually to is because Go types can have methods. And methods are the gateway to having interfaces. And having interfaces are important when you want to create uh, multiple levels of API. So in conclusion, write, manually writing the um, API library actually forces you to think about the API. Now, this actually results in a much, much nicer API based on use cases. but. It also exerts an ex external extra cost, if you will. Um, it requires you to be deeply familiar uh, with the library. So that's fine for small libraries, but for bigger libraries like CUDA, which has what? Q the CUDNN library has 200 plus functions. The CUDA library itself has about 300 functions. So that's quite a lot of things to store on your head at any given time. Before that, ah, yes, before that. Uh, I'd like to show you some good examples. The Port MIDI, um, Port MIDI library by Yana is the one that I use for the demo, and, and it's amazing, right? When I'm writing code with her library, I don't realize that I'm, writing, I'm using code that interfaces with C. And that's the bar we want to set. Now, the problem, of course, is that you require a lot of time, you require a lot of effort to manually convert your libraries, uh, well, manually write the wrappers. Uh, and secondly, I'm not a particularly disciplined or a very consistent coder, right? My variable names are all over the place. I've got long variable names, I've got short variable names, and if you ask me to write an API twice, well, it's gonna be different both times. So, that's one of the problems. Furthermore, manually writing an API library often leads to coverage issues. You see, time and effort is money. I can't afford to be writing APIs all the time. I'm not actually paid by NVIDIA to do this. I only so, when I do this manually, I only write the APIs that I care about, that I want to use. And if I put this into a library, this leads to essentially a bad library because people who want to use your library will find that there are missing uh, parts of the library that's not fully converted. To, fully, uh, to further illustrate this, the GoGTK uh, package which I mentioned earlier, it has been around for seven years. There are 55 contributors, and guess what? It's still only 48% covered. Yeah, so following from the coverage issues, there's also the fact that libraries like CUDA, CUDNN is always changing all the time because it's such a hot topic. And when I started plans to write um, the CUDNN library, it was at version 5.1, I dilly-dallied for a while, now it's at version 7.1, amazing. Now, you might be thinking, hang on, you're a programmer, why can't you program your way out of this? Well, that's the case. We're going to do automatic generation, which addresses all the downsides of manually writing an API library, but it also introduces new complications. It provides repeatable results. Next time NVIDIA comes out with the next version of CUDNN or next version of CUDA, guess what? I'm just going to run the same process and I'll get mostly consistent results um, with the ones that are already currently in the library. It, an additional free benefit is that um, with the same code, I can actually generate multiple levels of API. So what does automatic generation entail? It's quite simple, really. Uh, you pass a C header into data structures uh, that represents functions, parameters, types, whatever, that's available to the user, and then you generate Go code based on some rules. As an example, the GoGL, um, OpenGL library, which I use for the demo, and the GLFW library are generated with Glow, and I really like the GLFW library because it's very idiomatic. There are methods. 
and it's all generated by Globe. Whereas the, the OpenGL is kind of low level and more C-like, not a fan of that. So now the question becomes, can we do this automatically? Yeah, we can. You just write some YAML files, and C4Go actually generates the bindings for you. But the devil's in the details. When you convert uh, your C code into Go, you generally have to deal with enums, types, and functions, and procedures. And you have to write the Go equivalent of e uh, the C enums, the Go equivalent of C types. Enums are very easy to convert. You just generate your type and the cons, no problem. Types, on the other hand, are a bit harder. Because, because of the sheer variety of types, there are some structs that are opaque, there are some structs that are not, there are some structs that are literally structs that you can see, there are array types. So more thought and consideration would be required for converting C types. And optionally, you might also want to look into writing and generating getter functions for the fields within the struct, and I'll explain why later. But for now, let's look at functions. Functions are generally, uh, generally translated into functions, but Remember, I mentioned earlier that methods are also useful for generating interfaces, creating interfaces. So you now essentially have to go through all your library and determine which function will be translated into a pure function, which function will be translated into a method. And to complicate things further, we've got procedures. In case you were wondering about the differences between procedures and functions, well, functions return things, and procedures don't. C does not strictly have procedures, but a lot of C developers actually write uh, functions in C as though they are uh, procedures. So they take in pointers, which are essentially outputs, um, and then the, the function itself modifies the, the values at which the pointer is pointing at. What our goal is, is to remove those type of outputs and use them in, uh, in our Go API as return values. So you, as you can see, it's quite a fairly complicated thing to generate an API binding. In fact, the C4Go library has this to say in its README. The resulting bindings are as low level as C, and usually a high level wrapper is created by hand. Um, okay, sure, but that's not what we want. What we want is to create a user-friendly API library. And so fortunately there is a solution to that, which is to say we manually annotate the functions. You've already passed the C file, so you know what functions are available. So now you just have to say, if you see this function, you know, this function is a method. This function is a method of that type, and so on and so forth. But doing so brings us back to our first problem. Now you're, and instead of manually converting files, you're manually annotating functions. Bit less work than manually writing files, but still. So a balance needs to be struck. There is a sort of partial solution to this, um, and it, may vary with different libraries, but the, very, the, the libraries that I've been working with are fairly consistent. There are certain patterns that I can leverage on and generate annotations automatically based on those patterns. So our single step, our sing, uh, our single step generation has now become a multi-stage generation process. So this is roughly what you need to do for multi-stage uh, generation. It's slightly awkward in Go because Go, does, is, Go is not particularly homoaconic, but you know, if you structure your files just right, you can still do it, no, no problem. Um, concretely, for the CUDA libraries, I basically use Yarn Mercil CC package and wrap it, in, wrap it in a new package called BindGen, which improves nicer, nicer UX, basically. And then for each of these libraries, I have a generation program. Now, all is good with the notion of multi-stage generation. But there remain some technical issues that we will have to look at. Specifically, things like unclear type. This has got to do with the subtleties of C. C is basically a high-level assembly language, right? So the notation of used in C can often be a hindrance. For example, let's say we've got this function, um, CTC lost workspace size, and we want to generate a wrapper for this function. The wrapper function looks something like this, but we don't know exactly what labels and label lengths will be. Because from here, it says it's a const int a pointer. So it's a, it's a constant pointer to an integer. But is it really? Contrast this with this, which also um, says that the function takes an in integer pointer to an integer. Is this really an integer? You can't know uh, from just reading the C header file. The only way you can know is to read the documentations, right? And if you read the documentation, it actually says that it's a list. It's an array. 
So a better C API might look something like that. You'll actually have a label size, which, which is a hint that we can pass into our, our annotations generator to point out that, hey, this is, a, this is actually an array, so you should take a slice. You should generate a slice. And it's also important to point out that um, this square bracket thing is purely syntactic sugar. To a compiler, to specifically like Jan Mercer's compiler, it, it makes no difference between this and that. So really, the only way you can cleanly generate a, a function, a, a, a wrapper function for this, is to read the documentation and annotate this clearly, saying, okay, when, whenever you see CTC lost workspace, parameters three, four, five are lists, so you generate go, uh, go slices for them. Now, we'll also talk about the next type, next problem, which is the unclear use cases. Recall I mentioned that C programmers often, um, often use functions as though as they are procedures, right? So, for example, let's go back to our common whipping boy, uh, CGC lost workspace. Uh, from this, I think you can guess what the original neural network architecture looks like. So, what is the use case of algo? Is it an input or is it an output? Well, it's quite simple. There's no pointer. So, from there, you can actually infer that this is going to be used as an input and double checking with the documentation, you actually point, you actually realize that's true. It's an input. And this is one of the easier cases to detect and generate annotations for. But the problem is it's not going to be complete. A much better C API would be something like this. All inputs are const and all outputs are pointers, right? But the both examples we've seen so far leads us to one ultimate conclusion we actually need to pass the documentation as a machine-readable format in order to be able to generate our annotation. So we add one more extra, extra step to our generation process. Thankfully, the um, CUDA documentation is in HTML, and, and two years ago, they changed the structure, which makes it a lot easier to pass. And yeah, that's what I did. Essentially, you generate 80% of the library and then manually fix up the rest of the 20%. Now. Along the way to these things, there are other considerations to think about. When you generate an API library, right? here's a brief list of them. Um, it's more of a mixture of tips and things to think about, and we'll walk through them point by, one, point, point, by point, starting with performance. When you're writing bindings, you rely on C Go, and calling C from Go actually incurs a cost. About three years ago, when I did a, a talk in Sydney about building deep learning systems, I, I, I noted that the cost of calling C was of 170 nanoseconds per call. And then Cockroach Labs later that year released a blog post saying it's of 150 nanoseconds um, per call. Uh, last week on, on the Performance Channel on Slack, uh, Calibite Summers, she was doing some benchmarks, I'm not quite sure what on, quite sure it's LMDB, and she discovered that the uh, overhead were about 60 nanoseconds. A clear improvement over three years ago, but still, you cannot really afford to make Seagull calls in tight loops. So many Seagull calls in tight loops. And that's often the case when you deal with deep learning stuff. So performance tip number one, batch all the things. Or not, not really all the things, but <laughs> batch things, right? So here's a bit of a dense code. Can you spot the C calls? Here's the C calls on average. There are four C calls per call to the convolution function. Now, we should reduce that to one. And to do so, we write a new C function, and we'll call it go CUDNN new convolution. The, the body of the code generally looks pretty much like um, go. And this is before, this is after. Now, when it comes to batching, a delicate balance must be made. You must consider the cost of an overhead, say 60 nanoseconds, and over the time of, of the time it takes to do the actual C work. If the overhead is a large enough percentage or, or over the C work that you're doing, then it's time to batch. You know, creating, and setting a, uh, creating and setting a pointer to a struct, that's cheap. So adding individual overheads actually make the total cost of new convolution much more expensive. If you reduce that to one, you just basically reduce it by, by a, to a ratio of you know, four to one. An additional tip is to use A style, but I don't have time. I'm going to skip the next one. Next tip is to cache the fields. Given an opaque type like this, um, you want to be able to generate the Go code like the, in the bottom. Now you might be wondering, 
Where did these external fields, additional fields, come from? The original C type is a pointer that you, to, a, to an opaque struct that you, as the user, do not have any access to. How do you know that those fields should be in the Go version? Well, inference, actually. A clue can be found in the setter and getter functions, really. So this is one of the many, many possible setter functions for the tensor descriptor. I did mention there are many ways to do the same thing, didn't I? Um, you'll notice that it actually takes parameters of these things. And therefore, by logical conclusion, you can assume that the, the fields are actually stored within that opaque struct or somewhere that is actually associated with that struct. Now, as an additional benefit, here's the getter function. Um, you just pass it a bunch of pointers and you get the, field, the, get, the, get the results back. But guess what? That's an extra C call you have to make. If you cache your fields, you don't actually have to call the C call to get the, um, you know, you don't actually have to call the, the function. So this is, you, you essentially save a C call, but you should be aware that this can only be done in libraries where you are completely sure that the function will not mutate the data structure anywhere else. Okay, so there is an overarching general principle in all of this, really. Number one is to make all your data structures useful. If you design your API from against real use cases, you will start to see that many of these functions can be coalesced into one or few methods. Uh, few methods, not one of you, but yeah, few methods, essentially. And that allows you to eliminate bind bindings where unnecessary. Last tip is to check for errors in Go before crossing over to the barrier, uh, crossing over to C. Just basically treat C Go as an HTTP call where it's expensive. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, I'm going to skip because we, I'm running out of time. Uh, talking about stuff, stuff, stuff. Ah, leverage, uh, yes. Nil checks. That's one thing I did for my library. You should actually leverage existing, uh, when, you, when you're generating code in general, leverage existing Go source code analysis tools to analyze and detect error before, before you even Go build. And this is useful because in, in libraries like CUDNN, it's actually very difficult to write um, unit tests for. So static analysis is actually a very decent, uh, very decent alternative. I even go one step further and do nil checks, potential nil checks. Now, nil checks are a bit difficult in, in, in big programs because they use something called uh, alias analysis. And it's been shown that um, alias analysis is essentially undecidable. So it's not something that you want to go play around with un unless your name is Kurt Girdel and you can do it in a G string. But within the, uh, within the scope of the function, it's actually doable. So why not do it? Because that brings me to my next point. Because once you can do that, you can actually report on your errors. Okay, you can report on the errors for human intervention. You can report on the things that are not done yet, or you can just report and automatically generate GitHub issues that no one will touch for the rest of the year. So finally, wow, I'm getting there. We come to the conclusion. Uh, the source code for the demo I have is online, but to recap, I introduced you to the whys of writing an API library in Go. Uh, uh, Go bindings, I showed you why and how, and then I used the CUDA library as a concrete example. So what is the ask? Well, the ask is simple. APIs can only be improved through use and feedback. So please, use my libraries, use the feedback, and, and provide feedback. Oh, and along the way, help out with the automatic generation. It's now about 80-20, it could go to 90-10. And trust me, it's going to be very fun. There are going to be many challenging um, uh, problems to solve. I guarantee you that. That's all. Thank you.